Back here live from the glorious, luxurious, uh, folding chair sitting studio in Ben Salem, Pennsylvania in our basement. This is episode two of Baron Banter. Welcome in once again. We hope you enjoyed the first podcast. Tyler Zuli, my brother Brandon Zuli. We've got a special guest today, my good friend Chris Matej joining us. So now we got a three, three team, uh, three player team. So we're already expanding just two episodes in. You could call it a threesome. I was I was afraid he was gonna call it. <laughs> you know, it I had that. a figure I had a feeling you were going there and I was trying to avoid it, but since we started off on such a high note, <laughs> this is gonna be uh, another episode where I think we start a little bit more serious like we did last week. By the end it's going to be lighthearted and fun. And a little, you know, a little bit of everything in between. We'll have my rant, like always. We'll have a, a take from I think every one of us. We've got my rant, the last topic Chris brought up to us. He's he's kind of our uh, expert on this one. The, the the third topic, Brandon's ready to go. I think he's gearing up and ready to go. We might have two rants today. So uh, guys, you want to get started? Sure. Yeah. Let's do this. So like I said, we're going to start with the uh, the more serious topic. Of course, the sad tragedy that happened on Monday night in Manchester, a terroristic attack at an Ariana Grande concert, or outside an Ariana Grande concert. 22 people dead, uh, more than 50 injured. Uh, the police have named the suspect 22-year-old Salman Ramadan Abedi. I probably messed that one up, but it doesn't matter. It seems like he's just a terrible person. Uh, born in Britain, Libyan background, and uh, again, ISIS has claimed uh, backing to this this situation. So, uh, guys, I just got kind of want to get your early take. We know it's a tragedy, but... How how do these things continue to happen? Why are why are we continuing to see deaths and destruction? Why is nobody doing anything about it? I guess. You know, it's kind of hard to say because Britain actually had their eyes on this guy. They've been tracking him for a while. They know where he's been. They know his uh, his feelings on the matter and uh, about his opinions on ISIS and that he's a supporter for him. Uh, he's spoken out a couple times to his leader at his um local mosque about uh, the leader would go and um, denounce ISIS and talk bad about them and say we can't support them as Muslims and he actually he disliked his uh, Muslim leader because of that so uh, we had a lot of knowledge about this guy and I think between us three basic guys who have not very much history in um, the government or what they're actually doing behind closed doors I, I can't fathom the idea of how we're letting people like this just go well, and that's the thing. It's not like, you know, it was it maybe where and when it was a surprise attack, but like you said, it, this seemed like it was a foregone conclusion. It was going to happen eventually. And I know you can't really arrest somebody, at least in the United States. I don't know about in England, but I would assume it's similar. You can't arrest somebody just out of a whim, but a terroristic threat, I, you would you would think with the way that he spoke at that mosque and spoke against his uh I, I don't know what what are their their priest type you know, basically, what's their equivalent to a priest? Uh, whatever it's, yeah, whatever it's called. You think he, he would have said, "Hey, listen, this guy's saying," uh, and he very well could have because right. the the government has been tracking him, so right. they, they knew they know about him. And actually, the British government has been saying for uh, a while now that they felt that an attack was imminent. The last attack happened uh, ten years ago in two thousand and seven, which attacked their their buses and their subway system, and uh, I think. A large amount of people died, but that was right. their largest mm -hmm. terrorist attack. So it's been 10 years since one, and they felt that one ha was imminent and was going to happen almost at any day now. Right. Brandon? I I can't really say much on this. It's just, so, it's just something that, unfortunately, you get used, you're getting used to more and more in this day and age because it just happens all the time now. People are dying for no reason, and we can't do anything to stop it, it seems. Well, and let me put it into a more homey perspective. We'll bring it back across the pond to the United States. You guys know I worked in Delaware for the last eight months, you know, reporting on news and such down there. You saw it up here. I mean, it made it all the way back up to Bucks County into Philadelphia. The prison riot that happened in Smyrna um, back in February, it was a huge deal. And since then, uh, the, the former station that I worked at had a uh, very prominent uh, correctional facility person uh, on air multiple, multiple times saying, basically saying Delaware's not doing enough to help us. They're not giving us funding. They're not raising the correctional officer starting salary. And in turn, it's causing the correctional officer to nobody want to work with the correctional officers. And basically what this guy said was, I give it six months before another attack happens again. It's the same deal. It's like, you know, it's going to happen. Where's the preemptive measures? Mm -hmm. 
And um, going going back to what happened in England, uh, they actually released their military patrol in the streets with the local law enforcement. So it's like, that's great because they think, you know, they're trying to prevent another attack, which they think because this one has happened, that another one is imminent. They up their level of their um, their terror threat. They up the level um, from what it was previously. So that's great that they're putting their military on the streets, but... Should have that been done before? Man, many years ago, months ago, even months ago, weeks ago. You know, um, so that's what that's my opinion well, on the matter. Well, and I know now that a lot of uh, a lot of big events are being canceled. Um, the, there was a movie premiere set to come out in uh, in Manchester that they canceled. A couple of concerts have been canceled. I mean, even Ariana Grande came out and said, "You know, I'm deeply saddened by this. It hurts my heart to see something happen, especially in an event that I had." She's actually offered to uh, to help pay for some of the funeral expenses of the 22 that were that were killed in this explosion. But it's great that you offer that you know that you offered help, and it's great that people are coming together. But at the end of the day, this has happened now. I think far too often. Yeah. Another thing with with the way the bomb was made, they I, I just read up. They say it wasn't made by the guy who placed it or used it. That there was a separate bomb maker, and that he has done this before. And frequently. So it's not just a one man or even just a one guy backed by ISIS or even them. It's someone that was living there most likely. And I don't know if what's worse, if that he's there or that no one knows anything about this guy. And they can't find him. Well, I, Nothing. I, don't, I don't know if it's the guy that you're talking about, but I know in the last couple of days so far what I've read up to is that they have up to five arrests. They also arrested the the suspect's brother, and they also have uh, arrested his father. Um, so I so don't, at least they're yeah. making moves. Yeah, you know, I, and I feel like we've seen this before when there was the attack in uh, what was it Brussels, right? And um, a couple of the other attacks that has happened in Europe, it seems like it goes on for a long period of days where they're um, they're breaking into uh, suspected terrorist homes and they're getting all this intel and they're locking people up who are supposedly culprits in these attacks but you don't really hear much more after that were they a lot of times you read the news articles where they're saying oh that we took them in uh, for questioning but they were released you know right. um is that just because we can't put enough evidence to lock them up and claim them as you know isis supporters uh, a criminal within the attack and they actually are or are they innocent so right. it's really a tricky position there What's uh? I got one more one more thing about this to discuss before we switch topics. Okay. Twenty or twelve of the twenty two victims have been named, and I think this is what sickens me more than anything else. Out of those twelve victims that have been named, the oldest victim was forty seven. You've got ages of eighteen, eight, fifteen, thirty two, twenty six, forty five, forty seven, twenty nine, forty, forty two, and fourteen. That means. These are all young people. Uh, you know, 47 is not old. And then you have as young as 8 years old as victims. You know, every tragedy is a heartbreaking tragedy, but these are kids. I mean, a lot, a ton of them are younger than you and I, Chris. I mean, yeah. 18, 15, 8, that's crazy. Yeah. Um, I think the attacker knew exactly what he was doing. Um, he definitely was targeting women. Oh, for sure. And... Mm. Um, I'm guessing young children too, but over in the Middle East, this isn't unheard of. They target women. They target children. They're an easy target. Right. You know what I'm saying about it's, that? It's the it's the, it, the, the, the the weakest link, and I don't want to say that women are no, weak. No. That's not what I mean. But no. but it is the weakest link. Of, and, you and, know. and and in their mindset, in their radical mindset, they are right. thinking. You know, you know, let's let's kill them. They are they're not superior to men. They are not on our level. Let's kill them because they're the weaker. Well, I think, it, I think the problem is, even what, and when they do this, they think they're in the right. They think they're the heroes. Attacking oh, yeah. women and children don't make you a hero. It makes you scum. Well, and the thing is, too, you're right about that, Brandon. It's, you know, you're attacking women and children, you know, the, the way, maybe the thought process is, well, if we attack the women, you know, that they are the the reproduction process of our of our world, obviously. That's how... The next generation is born. If we take out the women, they can't have any more. I guess they can't have any more men to to raise and fight. I don't know. I don't know how they think. It's it's almost impossible to get in their minds. It, it is. All right, let's switch topics. Yes. Let's get 
back across the, our side of the pond will get a little less morbid. Uh, we're going to probably keep it on the, the negative side, at least for numbers sake. We're going to move again to President Trump. Two weeks in a row we've talked about this, man. I promise you not every first segment is going to be politics. It's just kind of how our country's going. We've got, I think we have three people here with three different mindsets across the spectrum. I think likely out of the three of us, in terms of who's the most conservative, closest to Republican, that's probably me. And then we, you have two people who are more closer Democrat than, than myself. So I'd like to get different topics. Through 100 days, which ended in the end of April, you know, uh, the first 100 days of Donald Trump's presidency, he has a 41% approval rating and a 55% disapproval rating, which since they started keeping approval ratings back in 1953 for Dwight D. Eisenhower is the worst slash line of all presidents. Now, granted, you're not going to get a John F. Kennedy where you're at 83 and 5. That's just insane. But to be so in the negative, just 100 and what, 120, 130 days into your, your presidency, something's going wrong here. I, I, I think another, I, I'm sorry if I change the subject here, but I believe that half of his disapproval is coming from all of his bad policies. And most of those are executive orders, which from what I've seen, he's done more than I believe the past two presidents in his first hundred days. And when he, and he's doing this when he was openly bashing Obama mm -hmm. for using any executive orders. Right. To put this into perspective right here, Trump um, will have signed 30 executive orders during his first 100 days. This is coming off of the White House's website. Uh, Obama, in his first 100 days, signed 19. Mm -hmm. So it's a little less than doubled. Yeah. So um, you're exactly right on that. Well, and, and here's, here's my, I guess, my overarching question. Oh, I think a lot of his dis disapproval rating stems from, you're right, the executive orders and the policies, but I think one that stands out more than anything else is the whole immigration debate. And we could have this debate probably for an entire segment, an entire show. We'll keep it to a quick hitter. You know, he says that, uh, you know, immigration is a big concern. We need to get legal immigration and we need to, be, you know, whatever, if you want to build the wall or not. I, I think my biggest concern with that issue and what people disapprove about that issue is, is Bill Clinton said very, very similar things during his time as a president, and everybody he got a standing ovation. Is it because Trump is a uh, a beat my chest, I'm better than you type guy? Is it just because people don't like him? What's the difference between Clinton saying we need better border control and Donald Trump saying we need better border control? I I don't know exactly what Clinton said, but I think it's it's another way he would say it because Trump has said that from Mexico at least. They're bringing rapists, drug addicts, and all the bad hombres, as he would say. And I, I don't know exactly how he quoted it, but Clinton, I'm sure, put it in a much more dignified, political, and just nicer way. Because I think that's what drives it. Trump is an ass. Through and through. It's not a lie. I think even if you back him, you realize that. But, and he has no, he has no tact at all. So the way he says things, it just immediately turns people off on whatever he's saying. I, I disagree with that because I don't think it turns people automatically off, obviously. The way he speaks is what got him elected. True. Um, True. Just because, you know, he's not speaking like a politician, the things he is saying might be coming across the minds of many Americans, and they they like that. They like that. You know what? He's not going to sugarcoat the subject. There are rapists. There are murderers coming across our border. He has my support because he's not sugarcoating that Yes, fact. but there's also rapists and drug addicts in the country. Well, you're right. Well, very it. true. But there's, there's, they're everywhere. It's not just like it's in Mexico. It's exactly. not like it's yeah. just in the yeah. United States. That happens everywhere. So... I guess go you know I, you know I think I have to to maybe side with both of you a little bit here and here's you know Chris I think you're you're right it's he, there's a reason this man was elected the mm -hmm. president of the United States and and there are a ton of people that it's not the staunch staunch Republicans that voted for him and it's not the people that said well I'm not voting for Clinton so I'm voting for him that won the election it's the people that went. You know, I don't really know who I'm voting for. <laughs> and then on election day, went to the polls and voted for Donald Trump. I don't think he won the election at all. Well, he you're, he didn't win the popular vote, but at the end of the day, it's the way that the country's set up. 
Well, this is a great um, this is a great way to segue into you know the the credibility of his election win. Right. There's so much with the Russian collusion. Uh, going on the, all the investigations. He fired the FBI director. He did in, uh, fire the FBI director, Comey. Um, there's going to be so much information coming out within the next couple of weeks we're going to have to watch over. Um, as far as impeachment goes, uh, he he's doing stuff worse than, than Nixon had done. Right. I mean, not only is he you know misleading the American people, um, but he's he's had help with a foreign government who we might even say is a hostile foreign government, mm-hmm. which is the Russian right. government. Well, and Donald Trump became the fifth president to lose the popular vote and still win the election. John Quincy Adams was the first in 1824, followed by Rutherford B. Hayes in 1876, Benjamin Harrison in 1888, George Bush, as we all know, with the you could call it whatever you want to call it in 2000. Did Al Gore really win? <laughs> I, it doesn't matter. He was the president of the United States for two terms. And now Donald Trump in 2016. The first three, at least to me, you know, personally, as somebody that studied a lot of, you know, the revolutionary period and about the, the 50, 60 years afterwards, John Quincy Adams, to me, was not a very good president. And, you know, it's not uh, it's not that he was terrible, but at the end of the day, you know, did he maybe cheat his way to an election? There's a possibility, and, and I don't know if you guys know the story behind that. I don't. Uh, but basically, it was he versus Andrew Jackson. And, and if you guys remember, back in the early part of the country, you didn't have a running mate. It was the guy that, ha- that finished second in the voting became the vice president. Mm-hmm. And basically, what happened was um, was John Quincy Adams was running against, uh, I believe there was four people running. Uh, and basically, John Quincy Adams' what biggest uh, opponent was um, was Henry Clay at that point, and Andrew Jackson was kind of a third. Um, and basically, John Quincy Adams said to Henry Clay, he said, listen, if you basically back off and let me be the, the, the guy, I'll make you my Secretary of State. And he did, and John Quincy Adams won the vote, and Andrew Jackson was all up in arms, Henry Clay became the Secretary of State, and you know, and that, that kind of, it was, it was a weird situation. But... I don't think any of these presidents, maybe outside of George Bush, was as despised after losing the popular vote as Donald Trump was. I think part of the reason that he's despised, Chris had said it uh, a few minutes ago, is that he he lies. He's a pathological liar. And even when you, and we had talked about this last time, even when you tell him what the truth is based on facts, he doesn't, he doesn't believe it. He he says you're wrong and that everything that he ever says is right. And I think that's part of the reason why everyone hates him. Well, obviously not everybody hates him. He, he is uh, still the president of the United he, States. He, you know, 40% of the country does approve of what he's saying, even though the majority of people uh, hate him. Um, well, yeah. and, and and here's the thing with that, that, you know, losing the popular vote with without, win, you know, with winning the presidency. Obviously, times were different because there weren't as many people. But if you look at the margin of defeat, you know, John Quincy Adams was at 10%, but his margin of defeat was only 38,000. Donald Trump is the second highest. He's at 2%. He lost by 2%, but he lost by almost 3 million votes. Now, again, like I said, that's a, you know, it's an inflated number because of the inflated population, but... Does that say anything to you guys, the fact that he has one of the higher margins of defeat in the popular vote? It doesn't say much to me for the obvious reasons that you stated right. before with the, yeah, more people. So uh, let's let's finish up on this subject real quick. I wanted to leave you, Brandon, by the way, when you said he, he may have said it more eloquently and, and more political. Here is what Bill Clinton said. Huh? He said, let me be very clear about this. We are still a nation of immigrants. We should be proud of it. We should honor every legal immigrant here, and he emphasized legal working hard to become a new citizen. But, he said, we are also a nation of laws. Is that any different than what Donald Trump's been saying over the last 125 days? I don't know. It doesn't sound any different. It sounds different, but it may not be different. And that's a key difference. Because the way you say something can immediately just set things off in someone's mind. And... It can immediately just have adverse effects on what you're trying to do. I think the major difference is 
people won't people just say just because I'm a support Donald Trump doesn't make me a racist. There's not racism. D- Donald Trump's not a racist person. Right. That's what people will say. And you know what? He honestly might not be. But this America first um, the l- slogan that he carries around and he gave at his inaugural address, um, the American first is something that uh, racists and bigots can... It, it sounds can, racist. Can, can, can get behind? Can get behind. Right. I mean, even though he denounced it, and it did take he, a couple days for him to denounce, he was um, supported by David Duke, which was one of the... the former uh, Grand Wizard Grand of the Wizard KKK. Grand Wizard of the KKK. Right. And, you know, and it's just, it's stuff like it's stuff like that that I think that people can contribute to him being racist. And the things he's saying when he says building a wall and about the Mexicans being rapists and murderers, that... The racist can still get behind. Right. Mm-hmm. Well, I let I would like to leave it with this question, and I promise you, we'll get off this. You know, you, you mentioned the backing, and and uh, yeah, it took him a couple of days to denounce it. And I think I'm honestly just playing devil's advocate here, just to mm-hmm. to see what you guys can can come up with. You know, if, if Chris Matei ran for president, or Brandon Zuli ran for president, and That's said the, uh, said you know here industry. are my ba- you know list one, list two, list three. Here are my my main points and. Charles Manson backed you, or serial killer backed you, or a child molester backed you. Does that make you a bad person because somebody said I I back you, or is it is it just the the, the longevity of the time in between him saying, all right, well, you know, David Dukes isn't really the the best forefront yeah, for me. Yeah. I think if he immediately denounced it, it would people wouldn't be thinking about it. But since it took us uh, just a long period of time. They're thinking, why is why is he doing that? Does he does he want the racist vote? Does he not care? It, which one's worse? I I think the I think the issue with it is that you need to step back and then look. Well, why would this person right. say they support me? What have I been saying? What are my values? What is my mission statement that these people are willing to get behind me? Mm-hmm. And if you take a step back and say, well, you know. You know, we have this in common. We have this mindset in common. We have this morals in common. Then that's where the issue might lie. How are we looking on time? Uh, we are reaching twenty-two minutes. All right. Well, do you guys want to break this one up, or do you want to go to this last segment before we break it up? Uh, it's up to you, my friend. Well, I think this is kind of your forte here with the accomplishments that have been that have come about. So, what do you what do you have on this topic that you really wanted to get to? Well, I wanted to talk a little bit about about what he's done. In the first hundred days that he's been in office, because he had promised so much. Can we can we do it in five minutes? I believe we could. All right, well, let's do it. Let's now. just hit him on a fast pace. See what you guys got. I'll I'll read them off and let's see what you guys can think. Okay. On okay. It. His climate change policy reversal. What do you guys think on that one? Well, it, the reversal is I think separate from what he be, you know what people are believing. If you're gonna sit here and tell me that climate change isn't a thing. You have nothing going on in your stupid little head. However, at the same time, you know, if you give me factual evidence to back it up, let's see what it can do. But again, if you tell me that climate change isn't real, you are more delusional than I thought. I think after his uh, his trip right now, he's in Europe meeting with the Pope. Mm-hmm. Um, he, they're really urging him to keep the Paris Treaty for climate change Absolutely. and environmental protection. And I really think that's going to be a huge step forward. Also, with that being said is that his Secretary of State, Tillerson, is a president of ExxonMobil. Am I correct on that? Uh, I believe you're right. So, so something... Conflict of so interest. if if it is a conflict of interest, but if we can if we can convince the president of ExxonMobil to keep environmental treaties, I think that is a huge step in the environmental protection. Mm-hmm. Uh, the both versions of the travel ban. Another executive order. I know Chris is very <laughs> passionate about this one. I think we'll let him start it. The travel ban, the issue I have with that is that I just feel like it was not well thought out. And he is promising. He's trying to make sure that the American people are safe. And I understand that. I've got no problem with that. And I, I have no, be amazing. I have no problem with that. But then... I feel like American people don't really understand what it is. Like, this man that, uh, the terrorist attack in Britain, people said, well, this is why we have a travel ban. He was a British citizen. Right. So, so it's like, pe- people don't really know what this travel ban is. Again, it's just not well thought out. Obviously, it's been blocked by judges across the United States who don't agree with it. Because it is just constitutionally not, um... Is not legal. Well, and like you said, you know the guy was a British citizen. Yeah. John Smith, the plumber who lives down the street, 
is just as likely as Salam, Salman, whatever the heck his name was, to blow something up. Yeah. Because at the end of the day, it's all about personal beliefs. The problem that I have with the travel ban, and I think you hit it pretty well, it's a very, very thinly veiled Muslim ban. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And also, like, where I'm saying, you know, it could be completely thought out. I don't know. I wasn't in the creation of it. I don't it. know what's going on in that I, guy's I, mind. I, or the, the cabinet or whoever was in charge of making that bill up. But um, where where did these nations come from? Like, why did they... Right. Why, where, why were some Muslim countries selected while others weren't? And why were some left out? Is there a conflict of interest, you know, where we get money and oil from some countries and we're like, well, we're not going to put them into our travel ban and, you know, aggravate uh, mm-hmm. a good relationship. Well, <laughs> and, and, you know, honestly, you take a look at this travel ban. My question is, what happens to the, dip- the American diplomats that are there? What happens to people visiting family back well, there that are American citizens? Wh- while the travel ban was going on, I think it was great. There was... um. I believe, I forget which documentary it was for, but it was during the um, Oscars. Mm-hmm. And the winner, or the winner of one of the Oscars, or the no- a nominee of one of the Oscars, was not allowed to come because he was nominated for Best Foreign Film in Iran or Syria, right. one of those countries. I do not remember which one it was. I'll bring the list up for you. Yeah, but he was not allowed to come to the um, to the country because of the travel ban. Right. And he, here is a man who's, you know, trying to get his, um, his views out and... Um, from the Middle East, and he's not allowed to come to our country to accept his award. This guy is not a terrorist. This guy is an Clearly artist. Not. This guy is an art, an artist, and a, a political figure. And he wants to just give us a better understanding of what's going on in his homeland. And he was not able to come over and accept his award or be nominated. So he, here, are, is it only six? I thought it was more than that. But this is what they have: is the six. It's okay. Li- Libya, Syria, Sudan, Iran, Yemen, and Somalia. Why those six countries? What is the connection? What's the connection? Is it is it the ISIS connection? Is it terrorist connection? Is it money back? Like you said, Chris, I don't know. Why isn't Saudi Arabia up there? Right. You I, know. I, I why think, isn't Iraq up there? Yeah. I think everything can be led back to money with Trump. I think everything can be led back to money with everything. Well, yeah. true. It's not just Trump and that is true. Now, last talking point. Okay. Before we go to break. we will go to break. This is a very long segment. The undoing of Obamacare. Oh boy. I know. Here we go. I know you guys. I know at least one of you has some... Here we go. All right. Gentlemen, as somebody that lived in a very Republican town for the last eight months, as somebody that was not a Republican themselves, but tried to look at the broader picture as a journalist, the the change in Obamacare or the Affordable Care Act, whatever you want to call it, my biggest concern was when they were bringing this about, it was, let's get rid of Obamacare right now. Okay, well, what's the backup plan? Well, we don't really have one right now. That's an issue. Mm-hmm. That was my biggest concern was the fact that there was such a disconnection between getting rid of Obamacare and bringing in Trump care, Ryan care, Republican care, whatever you want to call it. That that's what lost a lot of the people that that were that were you know originally saying yeah sure let's get rid of Obamacare. I think the biggest problem is that around two point three million I believe it said or twenty three million, uh, so much twenty three million just lost all their health care. Right, and I think like what you said is there is no replacement, and every single time they try and bring up a replacement, it gets shot down, and I'm wondering why because they control both the house. And the Senate. Well, and that's the thing. That means there are Republicans voting against it. So how bad are these replacements getting if Republicans are shooting them down? Yes or no question. Do you guys think the bill will uh, pass in the House? Eventually. In, in, the, in the Senate. Eventually in the Senate. it's going eventually to Eventually it has to. You think it's going to pass in the Senate? I think eventually. Okay. And, and it, it, it's not going to be what they proposed. Mm-hmm. It's going to be a very... Um, compromising bill. And it's not going to be anything like what we saw... Uh, but I, I think at the end of the day, it will it will eventually pass. Um, I think the the biggest one that's going to be have to be taken out if they want to pass it is the protection of all the people that are being protected in politics on their health care. Mm-hmm. But you know, at the end, you you guys know what I mean, basically. Yes, yes, yes. All the people that are voting yes yeah. are getting are getting a, they're, a pass, they're, basically. They're keeping right. What they, yeah. I'm just waiting for 
Obamacare to resurface under a new name like America Care. You know what? That's I got. I love that point that you're saying because let's say Trump. Okay, he doesn't get impeached. We got another three years or whatever mm-hmm. of him, and then say a Democrat gets elected. And then the Democrats win the House, and the What's Democrats to stop have them Congress. From that? They're going to create another health care, and then four years from then, another Republican's going to come in and create his version of the health care system. And then it's us American people are stuck in the middle between this conflicting war of Democrats and Republicans of whose health care is better, and then we are the ones stuck in the middle. No matter what side of the fence you're on, whether you're conservative or liberal or Republican or Democrat, right. you're getting stuck in this war, this tug of this tug of war battle between the two sides that um, we're, we're not the ones benefiting from this. Oh, we're getting shafted. No. At the, and, 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 you know, with this one now, and I'm sure another one, like you said, yeah. when they battle back and forth, another one's going to come out, mm-hmm. the quote-unquote pre-existing conditions. Mm-hmm. All three of us are fairly healthy young men, but all three of us have pre-existing conditions. Yeah. You know, your, your back's hurting you. Yeah. That's a pre-existing condition. You once had ADHD. That's a pre-existing condition. I had a seizure once. That's a pre-existing condition. For God's sakes, even um, somebody with anxiety, that's right. a pre-existing that's condition. That's the thing. Acne. Acne is a pre-existing condition. Right. So you're going to tell me I can't get my $2 cream to... I think we need to hit a break, guys. I, I, I think I we just, need to cool down. I would just love to end it with this. Um, I don't know how you guys feel about him, but Bernie Sanders the other day, he says, call the bill what you will, but do not call it a health care bill. That's that's really, I think, all you need to know yeah. about this, this quote-unquote health care bill. Yeah. That's a great way to end this segment, I think. What We ran 30 minutes on that segment? Yes, we did. Great segment, boys. All right, let's take a break. We'll be back on the other side. It'll be much more lighthearted. I'm going to get a little bit angry on this one, but it'll be not a political rant, I promise you. You're listening to Baron Banter right here on Lots of Networks. Welcome back into Baron Banter, episode two. You can find us on Easy Mode Earls on YouTube, at Easy Mode Earls on Twitter, and maybe we'll get a little bit fancy and create some other social media sites later. That'll probably be my doing because Brandon despises Facebook. But Worst Tyler Zuli, of all time. Tyler Zuli, joined alongside my brother Brandon Zuli, our special guest for the day, probably be making a couple more appearances with us as the uh, as the show progresses. My good friend Chris Matase. Guys, we're gonna get off politics. I promise you. I'm going to get a little bit upset on this next one, if you guys don't mind. So I was at the gym yesterday, and, you know, uh, if you guys know Planet Fitness, I don't know if either of you guys have really been in there a whole lot. Um, one of the, you know, Planet Fitness's big slogan is, you know, we everybody's welcome, no meatheads, like you're all welcome to, to be better, just be the better you, basically. And it's, you know, it's nice and welcoming, I get that. But then I go in there. And personally, I'm trying to get a little bit bigger, trying to put on a little bit muscle. And people look at me like I'm some kind of douchebag for wanting to lift and you know pick up some heavy weights. If everybody's welcome, why am I not welcome? What? I don't. I see. I think Planet Fitness annoys me sometimes. It's. I've been in there, and most people look like me, or they're out of shape. And well, they, it's a lot of older folks. It is an older crowd. I get that. They look at someone like you, in shape, young, athletic, and they could possibly feel jealous. So, well, and that's the thing. They have the quote, no gym intimidation. I'm not in there with a cutoff or a gallon of water or, you know, 100 pound dumbbells in each hand. You guys know me. I'm not a big guy. It's... It's not like I'm sitting there ripping off 450 on the bench with no spot. I'm just putting up a little more weight than the 70-year-old guy next to me. I'm 23. It's going to happen. When I'm 70, I would expect the 23-year-old to be putting up more weight than me. It's just how it works. The so, way the country is going, they won't be able to. Yeah, probably not. I'll have a pre-existing condition that will allow, allow me in the gym. <laughs> but, like... Why am I? Why am I looked at as the bad guy for going in there? Well, I, I don't know who's looking at you as the bad guy. For somebody, if you guys don't know what I look like, I'm a 270 pound guy, um, fairly overweight. I probably have diabetes. I don't know. But when I'm at the gym, the seldom times I am, uh, when I see somebody big, I'm like, you know what? Good for Good you, for man. You, right? You're. I'll be like you someday, maybe, probably not. But you keep doing you. 
I'll keep doing my five minutes on the treadmill with a water break and then go home and then <laughs> cry in the go, shower and then cry in the shower for a little bit. But <laughs> I'll make sure it's a hot shower so I sweat off a little bit more of the weight. Uh, all right, I didn't mean to put you on the spot like that. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm being completely no. joking. But like, if that's the thing. Like, if you and I were to go to the gym, yeah. we're going to do different things because we're trying to do different things. Yeah. You're trying to lose some weight. I'm trying to gain some weight. Yeah. So, you know... If you go on the treadmill and I lift weights, I'm not concerned about your workout. Well, as your friend, I'm yeah. concerned about your workout. I yeah. want you to do well and, yeah. and get you know and, and have a, and push yourself. But you know, if I see somebody that's that's doing the same thing you are that I don't know, I don't give a shit if you're walking for five minutes or you're running for an hour on 15 yeah. speed. Yeah. At the end of the day, if you're walking for five minutes, that's five more minutes than you walked 20 minutes mm-hmm. ago, and you're five more minutes in better shape. So I don't give a shit what you're doing on the treadmill, and I hope that it's reciprocated that you don't care what I'm doing lifting free weights or, or benching. You know, at the end of the day, we're all in there for the same purpose. We're all in there to better ourselves. And it's funny, at the one gym I go to, it's not playing as fitness, but it's a it's a dual-level gym. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you're playing as fitness is like that. All the cardio is on the top. All the free weights and all the other weights are on the bottom. Right. So as soon as I walk in, I'm not a very muscular guy. I'm just trying to work on some cardio. I go upstairs, I spend, you know, my hour on the treadmill, on the bike, on the rower, on the elliptical, whatever I'm doing, and then I rarely ever do any weights, so when I walk back down, I see you guys, and I'm like, oh yeah, there's, that's right, people are trying to gain muscle right. here, and then I walk out the door, so it's really not that big of a concern, and I, I honestly think, I think people who know what they're doing, they're lifting their weights, they're bigger guys, they're more athletic, that in their mind, and I'm sure you can probably um, agree with this, is they're thinking, they're not thinking like, well, look at that fat loser over there trying to lose weight, you're more thinking of, if you see somebody like that, like maybe I can help them, maybe I can right. give them a few tips to better their exercise program. Because that's the thing, <laughs> at the end of the day, it's, it's really just, good for you, man, you're yeah. in here. Yeah. The only person that I've got a problem with is the person that does nothing and says, oh man, I've got to lose weight, I'm overweight, but then sits on the couch and plays video games mm-hmm. all day. If you're there, if you're active, if you're doing things, good for you. Yeah. That, that's great. Because, you know, it, maybe maybe at the end of the day, I'm going to blow my shoulder out and I won't be able to lift. And you who didn't go out have a perfectly healthy shoulder. But that's a risk I'm willing to take because it's something that I enjoy doing. My lift isn't for me to say, hey man, guess what? I was at the gym today. You weren't. I'm better than you. Really for me, when I go to the gym, if I have a crappy day, you and I listen to the same music. When you go to the gym and you put some, some metal on, mm-hmm. you just kind of tune out. You do your thing. So I put my metal music on. I lift a couple of weights. I have fun. I really just I don't talk to anybody. I just kind of tune the world out. So what's the problem? You know, I'm not judging you. Don't give me crap. It's bas- basically, this is how I feel about it. And, and you know, it, it's... Well, I agree. You know, because at the end of the day, when I, when I go to a different gym, let's say one that's specifically for getting bigger and bodybuilding. Mm-hmm. I'm generally the smallest guy in the gym. And nobody looks at me like, ha, you're small. It's just like, you're in here. Yeah. You know? So, uh, maybe Planet Fitness has a different agenda. And I worked there. I did. I, I worked there for, for a couple of months, and, and I get it. I understand that there are no gym intimidation, whatever. But that's just, that's my rant for the day. Did you get the lunk alarm pulled on I've you? I've never gotten the lunk alarm pulled on me before, but I when I worked there, I pulled the lunk alarm on somebody. Because he had the, I think they went, I think our weights, our free weights went up to 65 maybe. Mm-hmm. So he had 65s and you know, he was, ah, when he was benching and slammed them down. And we went, you know what, we're hitting you. And he, I've never seen somebody like get more nervous or scared in their life that they've got this. Because it's a big, have you ever heard it go off before? I, I don't know, I, maybe for our viewers too or our listeners, right. maybe you could tell us what the okay, lunk alarm so is. Okay, it's so it's, they call it the lunk alarm and basically it's to prevent just what I explained. It's mm-hmm. to prevent people from, uh. From being, you know, meatheads and you know, drinking a gallon of, and basically your typical meathead, and and you know, there are gyms for that, and I get why Planet Fitness does that. Mm-hmm. So it's this big alarm, it's a purple alarm, and it's, I mean, it's like listening to a fire alarm go off, it's the whole time, and it's a big flashing light, and it, you know, it's it's basically meant to maybe put it's, you in it's your to place. Embarrass yeah, it's to person. embarrass you basically. So. You know, I've never had anybody, I've never had it pulled on me, but I, as I worked there, I pulled it on somebody, and it put him in his place, and I get why they have it. But I think that might be a little bit different from 
what I'm trying to do. Yeah. If you know what I mean. Yeah. Like I said, that's I an extreme. It, it right. may be yeah. that they're just they they don't they th- they see you as oh he's in shape. Why is he here? He should be at the other gym. He should be at the weightlifting one. Why is I I think they think they're jealous. Well, I hope that's not the case because I'm not a big guy. I'm I'm, I'm 170 Compared pounds to the soaking wet. In there, you are a big guy. I would just like the. This is going to be my last part on it. Is um, I think a lot of people have come across these opinions, and you know, this is just my own thought here. Is that maybe they're new to the gym? Right. Maybe they're new to this gym, and it's going to be a foreign thing to begin oh, with, with them. You know, they're not going to know anybody. They're going to think all eyes are m are are, are on them. Because they're new, because they're overweight, or whatever. Right. They don't have to be overweight, but for whatever reason, they're trying to better themselves. So um, maybe once the person starts going to the gym, they make friends there, right. whether they're, they're over some overweight people trying to lose weight, or there are some muscular people trying to gain to some more muscle, and, but they become friends with these people. They know that these people, they're, these people that walk in here aren't judgmental. Right. I think maybe it's more of a newcomer effect. I think you might be right, and I hope that anybody listening to this that's considering the gym and might think, well, you know, I don't want to be the, I don't want to be the, the, the most out of shape person in the gym, or I don't want to be, you know, looked at nobody's looking at you. We're all in there to get better. We're all in there to better ourselves. And if somebody is looking at you, they're a terrible person. Well, and they, might, they might think you're good looking. Well, that could be it too. With all the sweat glistening That could be it too. And, so maybe, yeah. maybe, they're, maybe they think you're attractive. And that, Gym romances are a big thing. It I is. Mean, you know, it, it absolutely is. It's the new is. romantic comedy of it, the summer. It, it really It's <laughs> like gyms and plate dating raise. Apps. Yeah. <laughs> hey man, I see you do that plate raise over there. I'm really into that. Maybe they should have like a Tinder gym, like where they can meet at the same gym. Gymder. Gymder. That is great. <laughs> or maybe it's people that go to the same gym. Patent. Yeah, it. there we go. That's Pat and Gymder. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's wrap this one up. We'll head to another segment. Brandon's got something on the other side. We promise you it's not connected to the first one, despite how it might sound. We'll be right back here on Baron Banter. Segment three back here on Baron Banter. A couple of nitwits talking about whatever the heck we feel like. Tyler Zoli, Chris Matejs, Brandon Zoli. We're here in our basement. I mean our exclusive studios in Hollywood. Wink, wink. Uh, Brandon, you've got a segment that's kind of uh, kind of been touching on your heartstrings lately. I got the rant on the last one, so why don't I let you take this one away? Uh, this is more of a question. I, I, I've just been wondering this for a while, and it's and I've been watching a few videos, and especially when you showed me the YouTube of Uncle Rob. Right. My question is, why is destruction fun? Why is blowing things up, like, cool? Why is it interesting? Like, Uncle Rob's whole thing is he lights shit up on with gasoline. So, before we get into this, we do want to put out a little bit of a, a, a statement here and say, when he says destruction and blowing things up, he doesn't mean terroristic attacks. No. What you mean is... Like a small scale, basically, I'm gonna light this table on fire. Why is exploding a watermelon? Well, I, I think a great example here is uh, Americans love exploding things. I mean, the summer is coming. We have fireworks. Right. We love nothing more than buying some fireworks and setting it off on the street on Fourth of July right. and watching the, uh, things sparkle. Well, uh, but you're wonder you were taking this more in like a video game. Perspective? No, I, no, no. I that, think he was open ending that, it. That, oh, okay. That's part of it. Yeah. Like. Grand Theft Auto, where you get to run a car off a cliff, jump out of it, and watch it blow up in a yeah. river. Well, I, I, I'll, I'll take that side of it if you guys want to take the more, um, I'll, you know, real life side of it. For me, and I know you play, play them too, yeah. Grand Theft Auto, Call of Duty, Battlefield, whatever kind of war, shoot 'em up type game you can think of, there have been links. And I'm going to find, I'm going to find, um, I'm gonna find a, a a link on it. I'm gonna see why are violent video games, I guess, beneficial, and basically, they're, they're an outlet. well, that's the thing. They're an outlet because when I plug when I plug Grand Theft Auto in, sure, I'm probably gonna take my car that I custom built and run somebody over with it. I, you know, in the game, you kill a ton of people. I mean, yeah, it, yeah. but when I when I shut my PlayStation down. I'm not going to go, man, I just played Grand Theft Auto. Let me go get my Honda Civic and run Grandma down as she's crossing the street. It doesn't transition into the real world. I, I think a mentally, Most of the time. Most of the time. I was just about to say, I think a mentally 
a stable, a mentally healthy person can differentiate what's happening in a video game and what because, occurs in real life. Right. People have done crazier things for less. Because, I mean, th- there was this one guy. His baby daughter snapped one of his video games in half and he killed her. Right. And But I, that's the outlier. That's not the, con- the norm. No. no, it's not. So, the norm is just a regular person, like me, you, or Chris, plugging it in and getting a few hours of enjoyment for stress relief. And I, I think it's also, like, I just think it might be that biological, like, almost like that animal... Animalistic, animalistic yeah. instinct that, you know, let me, you know, let me go and play and, like, defend myself. Because, no, in most people's lives they are never going to go and run over 50 pedestrians with a tank and then get this cop car a 40 minute cop chase through a city like that is not an experience that most people are ever going to have so with a game like grand theft auto you can go and experience things that you would never do in real life but here you are you live your life as a gangster you live your life as a criminal you're not a criminal, but what would it be like if you were able to do this right. going on the call of duty? I'm not a soldier. Some people might want to join the army. Some might people, you know, are military, but I'm not. So what would it like for me to be in a battle? If, if you go back to a futuristic, I mean, uh, one of the more world war two ones, they're more futuristic right. now, but I think call of duty is actually coming out with a more, um, older one in world, I think war, world war two. two. Right. What was it like for me to be on D day? What was it like for me to use these old, uh, well, and, and, and I think going off of that, you have to take a look at and you say, oh, well, you know, there are a lot of people that say, that's not realistic. Of course it's not realistic because when I play Call of Duty and I run about like I'm running Raxall just trying to shoot anything that moves, spray and pray type thing, when I die in Call of Duty, I know it's going to be a 10 second loading screen and I'm going to get put back, I'm going to respawn. Yeah. Obviously, if I were a soldier... I wouldn't do that because at the end of the day, when I die or I get shot at, I'm, you know, unfortunate, there are a ton of people that died from every war that anybody's ever fought in. They don't act like that because it's real life. I think one of the biggest problems I know you've always said with video games like that is you hate regeneration of health. Well, and that's the thing. It's like, you know, if I run out there and you and I come face to face and I have to shoot you 30 times for you to die... That's putting some kind of unrealistic spin on people's minds. Well, hey, man, I'm going to go to Iraq, Afghanistan, wherever. That'll be fine. And I can get shot 30 Mm -hmm. times before I die. And then, you know, unfortunately, they lose their lives getting shot one time. And they don't understand it. That's I I hope that people don't believe that. This has kind of gotten off topic. A little bit, but... But, um, just keeping with the video game... mm -hmm. have you guys ever played the classic arcade Rampage? Of course. Of course. So this is a game that came out in 1986. This idea of destruction and violent video games. It's not, not new. I mean, here you are, you're playing as monsters or creatures that are attacking a city, but you're still blowing things up, right. destroying buildings, punching through windows to eat people, to regain health. Right. I mean, that's just, it's, it's not, this isn't something new. And I feel like this does relate to what you were saying, because these are outlets for us to destroy or see what it was like what would it be right. like because it's so video games movie plots most of them are all based around violence and i think it's something about a humanistic nature within us that for some reason if it's not violent or if it's not destructive is it enjoyable what kind of games are there now i think nintendo kind of takes that more of mm-hmm. a rail of you know more objective but even games. with them there's legend of zelda you have yeah. your bomb bag and you cut things up with arrows. a sword exactly so that's a great point but is a video game where it's not violent is it do people enjoy it well and that's the thing i mean you take a look <laughs> at the study done that was done in 2014 by stetson university it shows that playing of death game death related games actually caused real life violence to decrease because the pixelated mayhem gives, quote, gamers an outlet for their aggression and keeps potentially violent people safely at home. Uh, it says games loaded with action-oriented sequences can even enhance motor skills. So are they are they real life? Um, do, do people do these things and then go out in real life and try to do them? I'm sure there are people, but most of us, like we said, for the few, the other three of us and many, many, many other people, it's just a stress relief. I, you know, I plug it on and I mindlessly play Grand Theft Auto. I mindlessly play Call of Duty. You know, and at the end of the day, I go and I, I do this podcast with you guys. I go and I look for work. Whatever, whatever the case may be. I, I, I would like to say this, like getting away from the video game aspect. Yeah. Well, yeah, we kind of have to go back to what you were originally talking about. No, but 
what I'm thinking of is I don't know I don't I know you didn't watch it uh, as much as I did I don't know about you I used to watch wrestling a lot oh uh, yes and yes. one person who was hell bent on destruction was Stone Cold Steve Austin for a <laughs> while where he literally dropped a cinder block or like a, a a railing on top of the DX Express and it just exploded and it was amazing and but like why is that like is that different than the video game but I mean it's in real life. They actually blew up a bus. Right. But we knew, like, nothing, nobody got hurt. But still, why is it as cool as it is? Well, and, and you know, I think all three of us are pretty good examples of, of we all have a, a pretty good background on this. All of us have been to Disney World many, many times, and they don't have it anymore. But they back in MGM, Hollywood Studios, mm-hmm. whatever you want to call it, they used to have that lights, camera, action, yeah, stunt, yeah, yeah, spectacular yeah. show, yes. which was basically car chases and explosions and... And, you know, people shooting at it, obviously it was a show and nobody was dying, but every everybody sat on the edge of their seat enthralled by this action and, and this, this mayhem and chaos. I, 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 I kind of agree with Chris. I think it's sort of an animalistic, primal nature that we just crave, we, cra- we want order, but we crave destruction because it's just upsetting the status quo. It's just... Complete chaos. I think, it's and it's fun. something that we want. It, it's something we want, and it's something that we can partially control. Because that I read that up on it. It's partial destruction, like when a child breaks a vase, he does it sort so, like half the time to get attention, but half the time because it's something that he can control. Because his life is all about what other people yeah. say at school with his parents. It's a great point. So controlled chaos is really the theme. Yes. I, I I got nothing more to say, honestly. Do you? You've got nothing on I mean this is your topic, so if you've got I, nothing I, else then I think I've run my piece. Chris? I'm I'm All right, I think we're I think we're good. We'll head to one final commercial break on the other side. Forty years ago today, one of the biggest movies of all time came out. We're gonna talk about nineteen seventy seven, we'll talk about two thousand seventeen and the future because there's going to be many, many more because we keep buying them. Stay around right here on Baron Banter. That is right, ladies and gentlemen. 40 years ago today, Star Wars Episode 4 movie actual 1. George Lucas is a weirdo. Thought process. Yeah, I don't don't quite understand. But whatever. A New Hope. Some people don't even like to call it that. It's just some people call it Star Wars. Came out in theaters today in 1977. The original Star Wars, guys ready for this, cost $13 million to make. It made $775 million in the box office, which, by the way, I don't know if, if... I don't know how to do math. I don't know if you guys are any better. I think that's a lot. That's a lot. That's a lot of money. I stop at 10. So. Equals, I'm going on... Why don't you get past money. this, Benny? Yeah, after I can't count on my fingers anymore, that's a lot. That's all we can do. But So Star Wars came out 40 years ago today. Since then, there have been... What? There's two in the original... Two more of the original mm-hmm. trilogy. Three in a new trilogy... In the new word trilogy, now the newest trilogy is starting. They have one movie out, one in the making. It's about to come out at the end of this year. Mm-hmm. A side story, another side story in the making. The worst Christmas special of all time. Cartoons, and in be- comics. And cartoons, comics, and in between, Action Disney figures. bought out Star Wars. So it's a lot going on in 40 years. I just, I, I can't wrap my head around how the first movie cost $13 million to make. And it made a ton of money. It made $775 million. Rogue One, which was the last movie to hit the theaters, despite the fact that it's not the last movie in chronological order. It's the second? It, whatever it is. It's the first movie. No, Rogue One is in the, between, the is in between three, and, three four. and four. Yes. It, may, it cost $265 million to make. It made $1 billion in the box office. Mickey Mouse is loaded. Right Mickey now. Mouse is making more money than than we know how to count. And granted, we together probably don't know how to count past thirty, but that's okay. What the heck? Who thought of this idea? I mean, George Lucas when he came up with this idea and said we're gonna make this movie a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, and it's gonna be about space and lightsabers and a guy with a breathing magical problem. Magical space wizards. And yeah, basically magical space wizards. 
Who would have thought that these, however many, eight movies I guess they have now, would have made billions and billions and billions of dollars? It's incredible. It's a religion. It really I, is. I think some people classify it as a religion. It might even be. It, it, Star Wars is a cult. Yeah. It really is. It has one of the greatest wars ever. Star Wars or Star Trek. You, uh, now you, I think you're going off the grid. If you ask a nerd like myself which one's better, you're about to get into an argument. Or well, two. yeah. and I don't, I don't know if that's an argument <laughs> we want to have right today now. Today is Star Wars' yes. 40th birthday. You know, you don't have your uh, new wife's 40th birthday and then bring in your ex, you know. So let's right. keep this Star let's Wars. Let's keep this Star okay. Wars related. I, I apologize. <laughs> so I, I think I want to start with the beginning. And when I say the beginning... I really mean episode four, which is the first movie, but it's chronologically the fifth movie, <laughs> and we're going to try to wrap our heads around we'll get, this thing. We'll start it from release date. From release date, right. And that starts with Star Wars. It was just called Star Wars at the time. It's, you know, now it's called... In uh, 1981, they named it to A New Hope. A New Hope. And yeah. that's, I guess that's when um, Empire Strikes Back came out. Or Empire, 19... Stri- Empire Strikes Back came out in 1980. Okay. So it was a year after. So... 77 came out, or 77 A New Hope came out, 80 Empire Strikes Back come out, uh, 83 Return of the Jedi comes out. That trilogy still goes down as one of the best trilogies of all time and across all movies, many consider it to, some be, some consider it to be the best. I want to start on just those three. Okay. You guys have all seen all three of those, correct? Oh, oh. yes. What's the best one? In my opinion, are we going in opinion or your opinion. statistics? What's, what's your opinion? What's the best of the three? I think, in my opinion, the original Star Wars is the best because okay. it introduces all the characters perfectly. And I don't remember which one it was, if, if it was five or six, but they basically do the same thing. Go up, destroy the Death Star, Luke has confrontra- confrontation with Vader. It's all the same shit. So, so that, I think four did it first and best. I agree. I, I think A New Hope is fantastic. I actually, I love the way Return of the Jedi ended. I, I, I think they could have kept it as a trilogy right, right there without expanding the, mm. the, the world of Star Wars there. I thought, I thought that was great. Um, but A New Hope is it's a fantastic standalone movie. Uh, as Brandon says, it shows all the, it introduces all the characters, the plot. You have a full sense of what's going on. Right. And I, I like um, A New Hope the most. How about you? Well, and, and I kind of want to go back on your point before I give you my opinion. You know, when you said... Um, no, nah, I just lost my train of thought. What, uh, what Return of the Jedi? Yeah, when you yeah. had mentioned Return of the or Return of the Jedi, yeah. what was your point? I'm sorry. I, 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 I said that. I, I, I loved how... I love how oh, the it end ended. of it, the right? End of it. Yeah, I thought it so, ended great. So that that's the that seems to be the problem a lot of people have is that the end, you know, with how Vader takes the mask off and he looks like basically mm-hmm. uh, he's just an old like, guy. You know, I, I wasn't even getting at that. I, I like when they're all partying with the Ewoks and you have the uh, ghost of Vader, um, okay. Obi Wan, and Yoda like standing over watching them. I just I just think it brings all three movies all into, together, all together, and right. you know. So I no, and I would agree with you on that. Yeah. And I think people people tend to like look poorly on that because of whatever it is. Maybe the addition of Hayden Christensen in the new movies, or the Ewoks partying, whatever, or, or even even with the newer releases when they have they show all the worlds partying and whatever whatever the instances may be. To me, I think it, it's not as bad of an ending as people like to give mm-hmm. it credit for. I think you're right. It, it kind of puts everything together. Mm-hmm. But for me, I think the the best of the three is Empire Strikes Back, and I think because it's it's more of a um, it, it's more of a saga to me, and, and mm. the first one's kind of like you know it is the introduction. It introduces all the characters, and it shows you here's who's who, and, and who's going to die, and who's going to to take uh, take the role on. But for me, I think the training, the training of Luke, and, and how Yoda is present, and all that kind of thing. I think that to me is what makes it a better mm. movie, and I think it, it's kind of more of the um, the expansion on all of the characters. You learn. Han and uh, and Leia's relationship, you kind of have a more of a personal connection with Han Solo. Uh, you, you you almost start to think that, you know, a lot of people like to look at Empire Strikes Back and say, you know, Luke's kind of a bitch. Yeah. A lot of yeah. people look at it that way, and I think you know it's it's kind of a, a turning point for him. So I don't know. I think for me, it's just more of a, a more complete movie. But honestly, any of the three, if you say, well, this is my favorite Star Wars, I'm not going to say, uh, well, uh, well, you're you're stupid, basically. Yeah. Um, can we all, 
uh, kind of agree that the prequel trilogy is not that great. Well, it's subpar for sure. Yes. Okay. Um, but now I we, believe we... I believe we're going to have to have a discussion on what's the worst We ha- We have a discussion on this one because okay. I think... Personally, I have a very staunch opinion on it. I think you and I are very similar, Chris. I think we might agree on this one. Okay. Brandon disagrees wholeheartedly okay. on this okay. one. So, I'm going to start on this one because I'm so passionately and adamantly for or against this movie. Mm-hmm. I think The Phantom Menace might be one of the worst movies ever made. Not just the worst Star Wars movie. And it's a shame because two, two uh, factors stick out for me in The Phantom Menace in A... I think Darth Maul might be the best Sith of all of the, the Sith characters. And B, I think it's got the best fight sequence mm-hmm. with uh, Qui-Gon Jinn and Obi-Wan and Darth Maul as they go at it. I think, personally, that's the best fight sequence of all eight movies now. I, but I, the movie in general is the worst for me. I have a big problem with the movie. Um, Liam Neeson, uh, he, he can't die. You don't kill Liam Neeson. You don't Neeson. kill Liam Neeson. <laughs> Liam Neeson's basically God. No, but I, I agree with you. That is that to me is one of the weakest movies. And to be honest, when it came out, I was six years old. Right. So, the, you know, I grew up with my parents showing me Star Wars, and at the age of six, it's kind of like Star Wars was rebirth. This is my first Star. Wars. It was my first you know? Star Wars. It was almost all of our first Star Wars, and um, as our generation, right. And at the time. I was like, this is great. I had a Star Wars 6th or 7th birthday whenever the, you know, whatever I was right. turning that year and when it was getting big. Um, but it just, when I look back on it, it's definitely one of the worst Star Wars movies. Uh, Attack of the Clones, I loved. I loved Attack of the Clones. Really? Brandon, you look like you really have something to say. I, that, I have to wholeheartedly disagree with as well. I believe Attack of the Clones is the worst Star Wars movie and one of the worst movies of all time. Why? Okay. Nothing... I I just have no fond memories of Attack of the Clones. Nothing in in it was good. Obi-Wan was crap in that movie. Luke... Or not Luke. uh, Anakin. Anakin was a whiny little bitch. Okay, so basically... He's he's Luke. Yeah. In in Empire Strikes Back. Luke was still cool in his own way. Anakin just complained and whined and did nothing. The only cool part is when he started when he went back to go see his mom. That was the only time I felt anything for Anakin. And I have to say, at, uh, attack not attack of the clones, uh, Phantom Menace. Phantom Menace. It's not as bad, and at least for me, because like you guys said, that was the one you were raised on. Yeah. And I have a lot of, I loved pod racing. I loved Darth Maul. I loved Qui Gon. I loved Watto, all that crap. Mm. It was just fun for me because that was my first one. You can love whatever you want to and love. Here, here's the thing. I like Jar Jar Pinks. Get the fuck out. I, Get out. I like Jar Get out. Jar Pinks. Please, you're done. You're off the show. <laughs> it's my recording equipment. Jar Jar Binks is literally the worst movie character in the history of movies. I like Jar Jar Binks. Why? Because... I was stupid when I was a kid, and he was the comic relief, and he was funny to me. Here's the thing with Jar Jar Binks, and, and I don't know if you know this one, Chris. Like, me and Brandon have kind of studied this one. Okay. There are rumors that Jar Jar Binks was originally supposed to be a Sith Lord. He mm-hmm. was undercover the whole time, based on things that he was able to do. He was the master of Palpatine. He was, ma- yeah, Palpatine's he master. He was Darth Palladius. I don't know if that's true. I don't even know if that was a rumor that that uh, that they changed. But effectively, they went away from it after they made the first movie, and they realized how much of a negative uh, response they got for Jar Jar Binks, and they went away from it, and they made they they put Dooku in it, and they put uh, young Palpatine in it, and I just thought they were pretty weak, pretty weak villains yeah. throughout the series. Here's the thing uh, going with that. The ori- the second trilogy was meant to mirror the first trilogy. And like with and with Jar Jar, it was supposed to be the weakling, bumbling idiot found on the side of a road on a deserted planet. And who does that remind you of? In the original trilogy. Well, it's C-3PO. No. Who turns out that like all right, let me clarify. Who turns out to be an incredible, powerful user of the Force. Well, then I guess you're trying to talk about Luke. No, Yoda. 
Oh, oh okay, I understand. That Luke finds him on a deserted planet. Right. He's just going, and then he then he turns out to be the greatest Force user of all time. Jar Jar was supposed to be the same thing. He was supposed to be a bumbling idiot until he you found out he was the he was the most powerful Sith Lord ever. Well, and here's the thing about the the comparisons to the two movies. Everything is set up. And obviously everything's set up to play three into four. When you make one when you make four, five, and six first, one, two, and three kinda have to put you on the path to four. And everybody knew that. The difference was and what made it a, an interesting storyline was how do you you take a look at what Luke did in four, five, and six and how he was drawn to the dark side and at the end overpowered it and, and stayed a Jedi. And you compare that to what Anakin did and the mistakes that Anakin made that Luke didn't make that made Anakin eventually a, a Sith Lord and Darth Vader. That's the point of 1, 2, and 3. Mm-hmm. However, they just it didn't it, to me it didn't go about the right way. A- any thoughts on that, Chris? I'm just not a big fan of the trilogy at all. The it's pre- understandable. The, the, the prequel trilogy. Right. Um, yeah, I don't... So- I don't have much more to say about the prequel trilogy. So let, let's get away from the movies themselves. And we talked about how back in, in 1977 it cost them $13 million to make Star Wars the original. You can tell there are some props in there and some, some uses of uh, cinematography that are, are pretty weak. And that's what $13 but, million dollars is going to get you. But that's what made it... That, that everyone right. uh, says listen. that that is so much better than any of the CG. Well, and I'm not disagreeing with you. What I'm trying to get at here is now you look at two, 2017, 40 years later. Eight movies, TV shows, comics, um, Disney buys them out. And I think the biggest thing now that we're looking at is in the coming year to two years, mm-hmm. there is going to be an entire land in Disney World yeah. dedicated to Star Wars. Mm-hmm. A lot of traditionalist Disney World goers... Yeah. Aren't thrilled with it. I, I got a cousin. He's a stock owner in um in Disney, mm-hmm. and he says, "Hey, as being a stock owner, oh, it works. For I him. am so excited about Disney and all this Star Wars right. stuff." He says, "As you know, a Disney, uh, cl- you know, someone who loves enthusiast. Disney, an enthusiast, and not that big of a Star Wars fan." He says, "I hate it." Uh, I was talking to him. He did a recent um did a recent visit to Disney with his family. He says, in uh, Hollywood Studios, in, Di- in the one Disney park, you walk in, you go to the left, there's there's Star Wars, uh, there's, um, what's the, Star Tours, right? Right, right. He says, you go, you go walk straight, he says, there's the Jedi Training Academy. He says, you make a left, there's the meet and greet with Darth Vader and whoever right. else. So, you can't escape it and it's kind of taking over for the di- people who just love traditional Disney. Right. Oh, and the thing but is, you're not taking over the whole park. Well, it, it actually From, is, because yeah. if you take a look at it, I mean, you and I were there not too long ago when they were in the heart of construction. Now, mm-hmm. I don't know what your family's done yeah. when they went recently, yeah. but when he and I went in the uh, the beginning of September, I mean, Hollywood Studios was, I mean, you talk about getting shrunk, and shrunk almost yeah. in half. It was basically, everything got taken out, the backlot tour was gone, mm-hmm. um, uh, the stunt tour is gone, and everything was shrunk to the point where... You know, I felt like I was bumping elbows every time I went, and it all it wasn't overly crowded. Yeah. It was the end, the beginning of September when a lot of kids were back in school. So I think this will open up a lot of things for for Disney, and it'll expand and, and it expands on what they're doing now. But you're right, there are a lot of traditionalists. You know, I th- I would consider myself a Disney traditionalist, mm-hmm. and there mm-hmm. I haven't been there when it was really you know just Magic Kingdom or just Magic Kingdom and Epcot, yeah. but. When I see, uh, when I see uh, in in uh, in Hollywood, uh, or you know, in in, in California, uh, Tower of Terror being taken down, a classic Disney ride for Guardians, Guardians of the, the Galaxy. Galaxy. Yes, I've got a problem it's, it's with that. It's upsetting. Yeah, I think this, a lot of people have a problem. And with this that. is coming from a guy I just saw Guardians a couple weeks ago, and I loved it. Was it. Fantastic. it was fantastic. It was amazing. It, it's one of the. I think it's one of the better Marvel movies. But as a Disney traditionalist, how can you? Take down Tower of Terror. Right. How can you change it? And um, here, here's an interesting thing I want to talk about. They're going to take down Aerosmith. Well, and that's the thing. There are there are rumors that if you've known, I don't know when the last time you were there, but yeah. when he and I were there, you know, it's rock and roller coaster starring Aerosmith. Smith, yeah. And every instance of Aerosmith memorabilia and and, and um, mm-hmm. things you can buy are gone. Really? Now, obviously, the ride is still Aerosmith based. You're not okay. going to take that away. Yeah. But everything that you could buy Aerosmith is gone. Now I have to think that that means they're making a change soon. I, I, I think with a ride like that, you can take, you can add any rock band. That, right. I mean, at one point, Aerosmith is going to become, you know, um, 
It's, They'll be like folklore. It, yeah, it's, it, you so, have to update it with a new band. So who's next? Uh, One Direction presents Bruno Mars. Well, and Bruno, that's yeah, that's yeah. the problem. If you want to keep it quote unquote mm-hmm. rock and roller yeah. coaster, you need a rock band. And who who's taking the who who carries the flag right now of modern rock? I must say, I would not be upset if they changed out the, if they kept the same ride props, they kept the same ride, changed out the videos and stuff like that, and added the Foo Fighters. That's the I only mean, band I could imagine, think of. Could you imagine, what do you call it, flying, you know, getting shot off at 60 miles per hour, rocking to um, All My Life, right. or the Pretender, or something like that? That would be great. Well, and that's that's <laughs> the only thing I could think of, yeah. you know, and, and that's the problem. There, Nobody's really carrying the rock flag yeah. nowadays, because it's pop music, and yeah. it's hip-hop, and... Whatever. This is getting completely yeah, completely off topic. Off topic. What, going back to, the, I think this, that's the theme of this podcast. This is off topic. But getting back to the um, the theme of Star Wars, one thing I would like to talk about is that there's been these significantly large gaps between the movies. Mm-hmm. So the first movie came out in 1997, and then the trilogy, uh, the original trilogy, came out um, finished in 1983. It took 16 years for the right. next movie to come out. Now, I'm not going to say that the Star Wars fanatics ever faded away from that, but there's, there was probably a significantly amount of people that backed away from that Star Wars um, you know, enthusiasm right. between that time. Then, when it came back in 1999, um, the prequel trilogy ended in 2005. Um, and then from the third movie up until what we would, I guess we call the present day um, trilogy. Saga. Yeah, Saga. It didn't come out for another 10 years. Right. Now, I don't know about you guys, but between 2005 and 2015, I was not thinking Star Wars. No, I, not at I all. was not. It was always there. It's a great trilogy. People, you know, reference the original. People don't really reference the prequel that much, but it was, it kind of faded away. Now, Disney's putting all this money into their theme parks. What happens these rides. when they stop making exactly. the movies? Exactly. What happens? Like, we have episode um, uh, eight and nine planned out. Uh, Eight's coming out this year. Nine's coming out in 2019. We have uh, a couple of spin-off movies. Right, There's with Han Solo. Solo and... Who knows? You might get a Jar Jar Binks movie. Who who knows if we're going to get something like that. But eventually, I think it might take another 10-year hiatus. Then Disney is stuck with 10 years of you know of people maybe not being interested in Star Wars anymore. De- declining attendance, and, and, declining enjoy- enjoyability. Yeah. Then, then what do you do? Do you revamp every park again? There's going to be Is another the- generation of kids who don't really care about Star Wars. Right. You know. It, well, and you things. you have a. I'm sorry to cut you off, right? You you have a bunch of young ne- nieces, nephews, co- or cousins, and yeah, yeah, nieces, yeah. but cousins. And I know your your one your one cousin is. He's huge into Star Wars. He walks yes. around like he's Kylo Ren. Yes, he does. But what happens when he is... Uh, you know, this comes out in 2019, so yeah. he'll, he'll be, what, 7 or 8 in 2019? 2019. So he's turning 6 this year. So, so he'll be closing in on 9 yeah, almost. Yeah, yeah. What happens when it's not till uh, 2029 when the next one comes out and he's 1920 yeah. and he doesn't care anymore? I mean, How I, do you foster another... I think that's kind of the position we're in. We, right. were, we were the same age as these yeah. kids. And... Um, as exciting as these new Star Wars movies are, and they're fun to go see, I'm not like, oh my god, I need to go see Star Wars Land. Like, that childhood, right. it's kind of out, because in in all retrospect, Disney, when you go to it, is a child's theme park. And I, it, adults have fun, but it's mostly geared towards kids. So, right. these, I, I just, I don't know what the theme park, the um, Star Wars Land, what the rides are going to be like, how kiddie they are going to be, how adult they are right. going to be, but... I, I have I have a fear for Disney that Star Wars is going to lose its edge and then they're going to be stuck with this land. This land. It's that, not like it's a ride. Yeah. You know, it's a full. It, it's I mean acres of land that uh-huh. they're putting rides on. Do you just spend all the money and, and change, change it all? It into something I don't else? think so. Hey, Fourteen acres of Star Wars land. Right. That's a lot. Yeah. I mean, I I, I think you know I'm going to look at how how big is Hollywood Studios right now by itself, and, and I know we're really getting off topic and out of time. Uh, you know, I'll look this up real quick. Hollywood Studios, I'm going to look at the Wikipedia page because that's the greatest thing in the world. Uh, let's take a look for, I'm going to, I'm going to go or search this here. It's 33 acres. Well, so you're talking about almost, it's almost half, almost half. You're basically f- adding 50% land to a small park. And you know, what? I don't think this is getting off topic at all because, um, this is all relation to where Star Wars is going. Right. Uh-huh. I mean, we're talking about where... It started out as one movie, as we said, 40 years ago in the beginning of this segment. With a $13 ago, million dollar budget. Thir- you know, with a $13 million budget. And now it's it's just so it's so massive. It's grown into this huge thing. So it's it's a theme park now. It's, it's 
you know, eight, nine, ten movies planned out. I mean, Star Wars is an entity, and yeah. like you said, it might be a religion at this yeah. point. Guys, any final topics before we finally wrap this one up? I have one question Go ahead. for both of you. Sure. I asked this to you, Tyler, earlier mm-hmm. today. Why do you think George will never release the original trilogy without his edits? Why do you think that is? He would make he's he would make an ungodly amount of money. What he, would he have? To he's lose? a proud director, pl- proud producer, and he put all his time and energy into these remakes. And yeah, sure, a lot of people don't like them, but I think at the end of the day, he's not going to redo it because he believes that what he did is better than what they originally did. But if he stands to make an ungodly sum of money. Well, and that's the thing. You could, if you redid them originally, you release and the original them, on Blu ray, you'll make more money than It's a $100 box set for three videos, oh, yeah. for three movies at the end of the day. And you got what? And then, then you've got five million dollar piece. Then you've got five more that you could do it with, and three more, four more, five more on the way. Mm-hmm. It's yeah, I, I agree with you, Tyler. You know, yeah. All right, well, one let's... last question. Okay, go ahead. Okay. Before we, this is gonna be a long one. Who shot first? Han shot first. <laughs> Anything else? Han shot first. That's all we have to say. That's what's gonna wrap it up. Han shot first, at least in my opinion. Gentlemen, it's and been a rest in peace, Carrie Fisher. And absolutely, yes. right. rest in peace, Carrie Fisher. Gentlemen, it's been a lot of fun doing this today, Chris. I hope you join us I, more often. I would love to. Uh, we'll have topics ranging, like we said, from politics to backyard sports last week to Star Wars this week, Disney World, whatever we're feeling. Guys, for my brother Brandon Zuli, my good friend Chris Matase, I'm Tyler Zuli saying thank you for listening to Baron Banter. You can catch us on YouTube, Google Easy Mode Earls. Find us on Twitter, Easy Mode Earls. Google Baron Banter, you probably could find it. Thanks for listening in. We'll be back next week with a brand new show and brand new topics. We'll see you later.